Great evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to Cafe To Do Night. Today, we're very honored to have a great Chinese Zen master, Zarko, to join us. And Zarko has, was a Buddhist for many, many years. He started out in 1975, studying Buddhism. And in the 80s, he started Dhamma Loka, which is the very first Buddhist community in Croatia. And I remember he, throughout these years, he had like many different great teachers visit his Buddhist community. In uh, 1996, he first met Master Chen Yen, a Chinese Zen master, Master Chen Yen. And in 2001, he received the Dhamma transmission from Master Chen Yen, which means that uh, Dhamma air in the Zen world is a very important position, which also means that Zarko is, uh, has a great wisdom and knowledge that can share with us all today. So the theme for today will be on martial art because Zarko has been a martial artist also for many, many years, and he will be sharing with us his knowledge and wisdom regarding martial art, Zen, and how is that related to us, such as developing well-being, how to live a better life, and most importantly, how to generate compassion and kindness for others. Hello, Zarko. Hello, Peter. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming here. So uh, some of our audience will I mean, basically know something about Zen, and I would say not all of them. So let's assume that our audience probably just know a little bit about Buddhism, know a little bit about Zen, but they may be interested about mindfulness nowadays. And some of, some of us may not know about martial art as well. So I guess well, I'm going to just start simple. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience in martial art, like what pulls you in martial art and what you, what you think is the benefit of martial art? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, I have to admit I'm not practicing martial arts seriously anymore. <laughs> well, okay. I'm not teaching anymore. Uh, I practice a little bit for myself, which is a kind of habit <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> after all these years. And, uh, well, I started when I was very young. I was 16 years old when I uh -huh. started practicing. And um, uh, how did it happen? Uh, my brother, my older brother, started first when he went to university. Okay. Yes. So we, we live on a seaside in Croatia, and he went to university in Zagreb. And there he joined the uh, uh, karate club, and he started practicing karate. And then he were coming back to, to, uh, uh, to our place, then uh, we were practicing together. So that was the, my beginnings. And, and like, what what is the thing in martial art that interests you the most? Other than you know you're being invited to practice. Well, that 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 uh, that changed over years. Of course, when I started to practice martial arts, you know, it was the uh, 70s, early 70s, and uh, uh, the the the. Best was meeting East in a way at that time, you know, even earlier. But uh, at that time, it was a very popular. Everything which was coming from the East. Okay. Yeah. So this, that's the time like uh, Bruce Lee was. Uh... Yeah, abs absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> it was a very, very popular at, at that time. Yeah. And you know, like um, one of the reasons why people love Bruce Lee, for example, is not just the martial art but also his philosophy that comes along with the martial art, right? So what was your interest in, let's say, Eastern philosophy, Eastern Buddhism? Was it well, all around the same time? Yeah. Well, despite this general climate at, at that, which existed at that time, uh, I, I joined the club, which was a kind of um, um, club, well, consisted of a group of people with a, uh, with a much deeper interest uh, than, than what you can usually find in karate clubs at that time. So, so these were the people who were inquiring actually into the background of uh, martial arts and yoga, um, uh, 
looking for the philosophical roots of these disciplines and uh, and so, so joining them uh, I also developed this interest and, and this is how it all started. Mm. What do you think is the key thing about Eastern philosophy or Asian philosophy that really attracts you and that you think our audience may be interested in? Well, you know, at, at that time, uh, the Eastern philosophy offered uh, the practice which which seems like a, a combine the theory and practice somehow, you know, mm. um, and, the, and, the, and the ability to transform ourselves from within. So I have in mind meditation, first of all, which I, I was very, very much attracted to at that time. Mm. So this is like a general, general, uh, uh, maybe, uh, Eastern uh, uh, advantage, if I can say so. So, if I understand correctly, it's really not just meditating, but it's like meditating with some kind of theory, with some kind of principle. There's some like the theory and practice needs to be together because I I think right now like many Americans might like to meditate, but mostly people are just meditate to feel healthier. Or feel happier, but I think Eastern philosophy is offering something a bit more than just healthier. Yes, absolutely. But when we are talking about Eastern philosophy, we are talking about very, very. Uh, I mean, the whole specter of various uh, teachings and, yeah. and and practices, really. You know, but uh, what was interesting uh, to me at that time and to the whole group actually was. Um, Developing deeper understanding understanding of ourselves and the world, mm -hmm. and and we were looking into Hinduism, we were looking into into Buddhism, into Taoism, into all those forms of Eastern Eastern teaching, and uh, and somehow Buddhist teaching uh, we find uh, closest to our own understanding. Ah, so I think you really hit the target because I think. In order to practice, I guess in any philosophy or even in the Western psychotherapy, Western philosophy, eventually, if you want to live a better life, you need to have a good closer look of who you are and what does it mean to be the self. You kind of have to like hit the right target. So, so it seems like you start Buddhism very early on, based on what I know about you. So, tell me a little bit more about your sort of Buddhist path and uh, what have you learned and how that combined with your martial art experience? Okay, <laughs> these are all huge questions. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have time. <laughs> okay, so uh, well, after I joined this, this group of people and after I started practicing with them, uh, we were very lucky to meet the teacher who was actually teaching Buddhism and martial arts together. And, uh, and this is how I uh, introduced myself into Buddhism much deeper. And uh, also what I realized is this close relationship which uh, martial arts and Buddhism have. And then I started to study myself because our teacher uh, was from abroad and uh, he was visiting us once a year. And um, I, I wanted to deepen my knowledge by, uh, by uh, engaging into, into self-study hmm. uh, of, of Buddhism. And uh, at that time in, in Croatia, which was a part of Yugoslavia then, uh, there was no really uh, easy to find the books on Buddhism, you know, because... Ah. There, there was no internet at that time. There was no Amazon or any other, uh, you know, way to uh, to get to those books easily. So it was a quite a long process of searching for uh, what books to order and then waiting for months for those books to arrive and so on and so on. Or through some other connections with the friends who were abroad and then coming back to Yugoslavia and so on. 
so it was uh, it was a uh, uh, difficult even to find uh, the, the literature to, to, to study. And then, of course, the English language uh, uh, was also, uh, uh, to a certain extent, a problem, you know, and uh, when you start, start studying Buddhism, you meet, uh, you know, completely new terminology, you have to learn a lot in order to be able to, to follow, you know, and to understand what you are, what you are learning. Yes. Yeah, but but it was a very. Uh, I mean, the whole this uh, uh, process was filled with enthusiasm, not just on my side, but the whole group was uh, very very enthusiastic. And uh, eventually, um, uh, well, I I start I start I thought that to um, study properly and to discipline myself it would be very good to start the study group actually and then working together with the group uh, uh, we continue uh, our, our studies so that's how like you sort of build a community a buddhist community Th that was the beginning that was the beginning of it wow i mean it's very uh I mean, nowadays it's hard to imagine, right? I mean, like if we want to read anything about Buddhism, Eastern philosophy, you could just like Google it and found it. I guess at that time, it's precious to get this yes. kind of information. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, nowadays uh, uh, we can get all information, you know, whatever we want to find, we can we can find it very, very easily. At that time, it was a quite, uh, quite a difficult. Um, Probably for people in, in, in Western Europe and US, that was no problem. But uh, <laughs> for us who were living in a, in a socialist country, um, which was much, much more open than, than, than the other <laughs> communist country at that time. But anyway, it was, uh, it was uh, still, still difficult, difficult. Yeah. So, so how, how, for those who are not familiar with martial art or zen how what is the relationship between martial art and zen for our audience like like how are they related because martial art is like hey i'm just learning this skill and i you know i beat up another guy how is that related to like better ourselves well yeah then the, the, the people uh think about the martial arts and uh, and the buddhism they don't usually see any 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 relation right. uh quite the opposite uh, as martial arts present themselves very much uh, um, uh, in, a, in a violent way connected to violence uh, on the other hand buddhism is known as a peaceful religion religion right. of it's very so conflicting the, yeah these two uh, is like uh, you know two opposite two opposite things, and uh, and th this is a first impression because uh, uh, you know when you start practicing martial arts, you actually enter into process of uh, discovering yourself. Mm. Of course, uh, if 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 you are observing yourself <laughs> in the process. <laughs> so what I want to say is that the martial arts has this potential. You know to uh, to observe yourself during the practice and uh, and discovering a lot of things about yourself on the one hand on another hand the whole concept of martial arts is uh, actually about how to how to um, overcome the conflict how to overcome may maybe uh, it is not uh, uh, it is not understood in that way. Uh, mostly people think of martial arts as the practice in which you learn how to win, how to mm -hmm. beat the other guy, as you said earlier, you know. Right. But, uh, but when you think a little bit more deeper about it, then you see that, that actually uh, you learn how to, by practicing martial arts, you learn how to deal with the, with the violence, you learn how to how to um, neutralize that that violence, how to overcome it. Mm -hmm. 
So th th this is, I think, the main and, and, and the most important uh, um, message. From martial arts. From martial arts. Yeah. Right. How do we, and I think it's especially relevant to our society today because I mean, at least in America right now, we have a lot of conflict. So I, I think we are all very interested in how to deal with conflict, not just physical conflict, but also conflicting views between you and your friends, different political party and different personality at work. I mean, and of course there's conflict within the self that we have to deal with. So, so what is the source of conflict you would say based on Zen teaching or, and how, how should we understand our conflict better? Um, well, before I answer that question, I would, I would rather go uh, a little bit back to say uh, more about uh, connection of martial arts and, 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 and the Buddhism in general. Ah, good, good. Uh, you know, uh, every spiritual tradition has, well, maybe not every spiritual tradition, but, but uh, some uh, uh, important spiritual traditions, they all have kind of physical training uh, present. Hmm. Uh, and uh, we know all about uh, Hinduism and uh, yoga or various forms of yoga. We know that uh, uh, Ta Taoism also have their own uh, uh, kind of physical discipline, Tai Chi, Chuan, and, and, and so on. And the Buddhism is connected with the, with the martial arts. So this history uh, goes in ancient time, really. And uh, we could talk about, about it uh, uh, from the perspective of um, Indian society and uh, Kshatriya or warrior case there. Uh, Buddha belonged to that case uh, and uh, and later on, Bodhidharma, the founder of Chan, also, uh, uh, according to legend, belonged to that to that case. Mm. So there is there is a kind of a connection uh, there from the very beginning of, of, of Buddhism. Uh, and uh, later on in China, the, the famous Shaolin monastery uh, uh, was or become very 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 famous for. For its connection with the with the martial martial arts, and um, so th th this is like a like a, a you know historical roots of mm. connection between Buddhism and and martial arts. But if we look at the martial arts, there is some something in it which uh, which uh, is very meaningful uh, from the Buddhist perspective. For example, there is this life and death situation. Know, life and that situation mm. that that is a very uh, a very uh, how to say um, uh, important existential dilemma <laughs> yes. you know and then there is a there is a self-defense aspect of martial arts but also you can say uh, if you don't take it for granted you can say uh, who, whom am I defending when hmm. uh, I'm defending? So who am I? You know, so this, this is another very, very important existential, uh, you know, question, actually. And, uh, uh, and so for, for this reason, you know, uh, practicing martial arts help us to focus very strongly because everyone is really, you know, I mean, everyone has these 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 questions mm. built deeply into ourselves, you know, and uh, it's easily that easily attracts our full attention, you know. So, and uh, for that reason, we can see that the martial arts in general have these potential of uh, of being used uh, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual context as a practice uh, which can help us understand ourselves better uh, which can help us understand the conflict uh, mm -hmm. much better 
and of course, which can help us uh, uh, eventually overcoming the conflict. And this brings me to your to your <laughs> uh, <Big> question. <laughs> question about the sources sources of conflict. Uh, well, this is a huge subject also you know, because we can we can talk about uh, external causes of conflict. We can talk about internal causes of conflict and even maybe about the very root of conflict. Hmm. So uh, looking externally, it is uh, any, any action which harm other people, you know, uh, um, whether verbally or physically can be considered the, 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 the source of, of violence because once, um, once we are heard by others, very likely that we will uh, also experience negative emotion and we will uh, respond to, to, to that activity more or less in the same way. So this is how the violence is perpetuated. Um, and uh, more, well, th th there, are, there are other forms of violence, you know, uh, right. in, 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 in in society also you know the the political violence the economical violence uh, structural violence violence in, in in general you know um so th th this is something which this is something which uh, uh is present everywhere really in all sphere of society mm -hmm. But from the Buddhist perspective, uh, the, the main causes of this violence are internal, are internal. Mm -hmm. And uh, Buddhism usually talks about uh, uh, violence um, as, which comes as a result from a very strong attachment to views, mm -hmm. very strong attachment to views. And on the other hand, attachment, uh, sorry, the, the violence which comes as a result of a strong attachment to desires of mm -hmm. various kinds for a material thing or whatever. So these are, these are like the two main sources of violence. And if we look at the world today, we can see that, uh, you know, violence between um, people individually, between uh, inside the groups and then in between groups uh, between nations and so on uh, between religions very much also uh, it comes from the very strong attachment to certain views the belief that I, I, my, my philosophy my life uh, uh, philosophy uh, my religion my nation my group is the best and the right you know, yes. and the others are wrong and therefore um, I have to do something about it <laughs> yes. or we have to do something about it so uh, the, the, the stronger these views are there is a less space uh, and opportunity for to understand other and the, the, the less opportunity for uh, to be tolerant toward, toward mm -hmm. the other groups other nations and so yeah. on so this is a this is a it goes very very uh, uh, deep you know this uh, attachment to, to yeah. use and we are usually not aware of them it's attachment to our own identity you know and this identity can be of various kind religious identity nationalistic and so on and so on mm -hmm. but uh, whenever there is this strong attachment present that takes away from us the openness. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it takes away from us uh, sympathy and compassion towards the people who are different, who hold different views, or who follow different religions, or who are from different nationality, and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, the other, the other source of violence is. Uh, is uh, attachment to desires, which when it becomes very strong, it, it leads to greed. 
you know, and yes. uh, when I can't satisfy my desires and when I can't satisfy my greed, I always find someone who is uh, guilty for that, you know, mm. who is uh, obstructing me and uh, who doesn't allow me to to uh, gain what uh, what I uh, want to gain. You know? mm-hmm. So um, it's easy to see how the greed turns turns into into violence. You know, where it, well, it turns to anger, it turns to hatred, and it turns eventually to violence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, our society, th- there is a there is a lot of example of that. <laughs> lot yes. of example of that. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's great that you point out that one of the key source of the conflict is really about identity and views and desires, right? And and I also like what you said earlier. All spiritual practice has some kind of physical component to it, such as martial art and Zen. And and I I really like what you said about martial art and Zen in the sense that. Martial art is a reminder of life and death, existential issues, right? The, the, the key existential issue we all need to face is what is death? What does it mean to die? And what does it mean to be me? And, and I think by practicing martial art, it actually helps us to remind ourselves these kind of existential issues and bring up our existential doubt which I think is re- very related to our attachment of views and attachment of identity. What you th- how do you think, what you think is the relationship between existential issues and our attachment to the views? <laughs> um, well, there, there is a relation there, definitely. Whatever kind of uh, identity we have, um, uh, we have it because, well, in order to make ourselves secure, in order to make uh, ourselves, uh, um, well, more more secure, more safe, mm. uh, and. Uh, Belonging to to certain groups, belonging to 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 uh, religious group, uh, national national group, and so on. This is all. This is all something which uh, make us uh, feel safe, feel 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 secure. This is a this is a reason uh, why we uh, have this strong attachment to to this uh, to this identity, and. Uh, uh, usually, this, you know, this kind of um, identity which we don't question, which we take for granted, um, is farther strengthened by uh, by uh, um, having the opposite of it. You know, having the the people who who uh, have a different identities. Hmm. Who are not like us, you know, and uh, therefore, um, as long as 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 my own identity is uh, um, strengthened by having the having the opposite from it, I'm not really I'm not really uh, in a position to to question my own identity. I am not in a position to um, ask myself honestly, you know, sincerely, who am I? Mm. You know, who am I really? You know, uh, when, when, when we put aside the religion, when we put aside the nationality, when we put aside some kind of local belonging, <laughs> you know, uh, group and family and everything, What's left? Who am I in the end? You know, what's what's my true nature? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, someone who has a very strong, very strong attachment to identity is a person who really doesn't question that identity. 
because ah. every questioning of that identity becomes a threat. Mm -hmm. A threat, you know, it's opposite from feel secure, feel, you know, uh, safe, knowing who 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 I am. Uh, we, people usually need to know who they are, but instead yeah. of, instead of uh, 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 seriously questioning that. They go. They go for uh, belonging to to this group, to that group, you know, and so on. Because that is much easier than than actually starting questioning seriously. I think that's a great point because it's just a lot easier to see myself with a label than truly explore who I am as a person. And and often not only we see ourselves as a label, we also see other as a label, mm. as if like if you're. If you're stupid, then that's it. That's who you are. I'm smart. That's it. That's who I am. I'm the smartest person. One big label. Everyone else sucks. <laughs> it's a, it's a, very simple way out of the existential question. I I think psychologically speaking, at least from the Western psych psychology, Western psychotherapy, we know that. Um, Psychologically speaking, we know none of us will live forever, but but somehow we're looking for ways to live forever. And sometimes belonging to a group, belonging to an identity, give us the illusion that we will last forever. And and I think that kind of motivate, that may be a motivation for people to latch on to a an identity, to a view, so give them a sense of. It's like a security blanket, but not so secure. <laughs> yeah, that's that's sure. I agree with you. I agree with you. You know, uh, there is a saying in Buddhism uh, that those of us who know that we will die are never quarreling with each other, <laughs> are never in conflict with each other. Uh, and those who Th those who knows that we will die here mm -hmm. never enter into conflict with another people. Wow. You know, because, because uh, as you say, somehow we believe that we will never die. <laughs> you know, there, is, there is this idea of uh, me existing in the past, existing now, and probably existing in the future. Very mm -hmm probably in, in, in people's mind in the way they experience that so uh, what is lacking there is uh, is a recognition of uh, of a basic fact of life and that is impermanence right uh, if we if we start to to um, introspect if we, if we try to observe ourselves or just the nature around ourselves uh, we we have to uh, see and uh, and realize that uh, neither we nor nor environment is staying the same nor other people mm -hmm. we are all continuously continuously changing and uh, and this is not something people like to like to acknowledge and uh, like to observe because it brings a lot of fear precisely because it, it goes against the fixed identity you know mm -hmm. who am i and 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 to what I belong, what are my values, and so on. You know, when you start to contemplate freely uh, yourself and other people and environment around yourself, then, then, uh, well, you bring yourself uh, um, into dangerous, dangerous uh, uh, situation. You know, because what you find out might be contrary to what you believe. So for this reason, uh, people don't like to do that. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we are, um, how to say, brave enough to uh, continue our contemplation you know, and uh, to observe ourselves and the world, then we come closer actually to, to, to what life is. We come closer to, to the very nature of, 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 of life, you know, and reality in which we live. And then we realize that, you know, the, the fact of impermanence uh, uh, is something which, uh, uh, which
which creates life, or better to say, without impermanence, the life wouldn't exist at all. You know, mm -hmm. everything would be dead. You know, the, 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 the nothing would change. So the life is change. The life is impermanence. You know, and then more than that, if we look even deeper, we can discover that. Uh, you know that uh, everything is in the light of impermanence. Everything is really uh, unique. Everything is uh, uh, important. We change actually uh, the values which we which we have in life through mm -hmm. that contemplation by by seeing you know that uh, that uh, phenomena and people and everything around us are really uh, really unique and uh, and that uh, we should be grateful for being able to meet them to experience them whatever you know mm -hmm. so th th this really changes the way uh how we relate to ourselves to environment to other people yes i, I think although we people say they know things change but deep down inside they feel like the self is always the same there's always a constant self there that we wish to not change or always going to be there. I guess that's what the Hinduism was about when they talk about Atman. There's some real self somewhere that's not changing, which this kind of promote the concept of conflict because if there's a real thing A, then there's a real thing B, as you will always be in conflict. But if you could see impermanence, mm -hmm. A can never have conflict with B because both are changing all the time. So there's no conflict. Everything is like water. As Bruce Lee said, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, the, 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 the absence of conflict doesn't come from the very fact that things are changing, but from the our, our self realizing that there is nothing there to be attached to. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? <laughs> so we are changing all the time, but we are still in conflict, you know? But if we realize that things are changing, then there is there is no much point in in being attached to anything mm -hmm. and by by realizing that you know this this strong grip which we uh, uh, have you know holding on to uh, life and, and and whatever is there um, uh, relaxes and and uh, we relax mm -hmm. and, and then the space is created in which uh, we see and experience life much, much on a much more deeper level than than, than the otherwise. You know? So the practice of martial art is really not just about physical conflict, but it's really a way to reveal our views and attachments, and hopefully we can work on those views and attachments. Yeah, but you know, I I wouldn't say that the martial arts by itself are that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can. You can practice martial arts all your life, and 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 uh, not not you know not realizing any of any it. kind of insight, <laughs> right? Of right. Because because usually, uh, if we don't look deeper into it, uh, and if we don't have anyone who will tell us to look deeper and and learn us how to to look deeper, you know, it's difficult to do that. Yes, uh, and. Uh, the martial arts, you know, can serve the two purposes. They can lead to deeper understanding of ourselves and the conflict and how to overcome conflict, or they 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 can lead to to the another direction of developing, uh, uh, you know, ego mm -hmm. and uh, become more selfish and, uh, you know, that that is completely opposite. What will happen depends very much uh, on who is teaching us and also uh, how we understand what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that, that schools exist uh, who are transmitting that kind of knowledge as, as, as a kind of a tradition at all. But it depends very much on the individual people who, uh, who uh, practice uh, who are on the spiritual path themselves, and then uh, they they bring that into the martial arts. 
the, the martial arts itself has a potential for that. Mm -hmm. Whether that potential will be will be realized, that depends very much on, on, on other causes and conditions which are involved. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because, uh, yes, that's a very important point. Uh, this reminds me for our older audience who may have saw Karate Kid. Have you ever watched Karate Kid? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Cobra Kai versus Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> both are training in martial art, but can bring you to both different very directions. That, that is, uh, I think that's a first. So theory and practice really do need to go together hand in hand in some way. I think as a judo practitioner myself, the, the key principle of judo, there are two key principles. First one is the maximum efficient use of your energy, which is you gotta know yourself to make the best of yourself. But the second principle is even more important. Use this energy to be beneficial for yourself and the others. Can you say a few words about how martial art, if training correctly, can be beneficial for the society in terms of cultivating compassion and kindness as a closing remark. Uh, well, the more, we, the more we understand ourselves um, through martial arts, but in general, the more we understand ourselves, uh, the more we understand the the ways in which we are inter interconnected with others. You know, and ultimately, there is no really self and other as a two opposing, opposing realities. You know, uh, we are all interconnected and uh, we don't really exist separately. And this is, I think, the greatest illusion uh, which, um, which is formed on the basis of those fixed identities we talked earlier about. You know, so as long as we, as long as we uh, think of ourselves as being separate, the the, the uh, world around us is threatening. You know, and uh, conflict naturally arises out of out of that kind of view. You know, but the more we, uh, the more we. Uh, become aware of uh, uh, ways in which we are really deeply interconnected with everything around us, the more we become aware of uh, ourselves being dependent in uh, various ways, no known and unknown to everything which surround us, the more, the more likely we will develop the kind of responsibility responsibility on the one hand and uh, and uh, actually um, compassion on the other you know? mm -hmm. uh, and that responsibility is uh, is uh, simply a result of uh, uh, it, this is not a quality which we which we uh, cultivate independently somehow but the deeper you know the deeper we see, some things naturally are arising. You know, our negative emotions, for example, they, they are a result of the way we see ourselves in the world. Mm -hmm. When that view is changed, the, the, the connecting emotions are, are, are changing as well. You know, so yes. uh, when, 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 when we have this deeper understanding, different emotion arises. We call them positive emotions, like a, like a, loving kindness or mm -hmm. uh, compassion or sympathetic joy uh, and equanimity these four are known in buddhism very much as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, how they are called the abode of the gods you know mm -hmm. because when we have these emotions we we, we really feel like like being gods Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not anymore um, uh, connected to our usual um, conflict co conflicted nature and situations in life. This is when we rise above uh, those those conditions, you know. 
and um, and you know from that perspective how we relate to other people and how we relate to nature how we relate to to anything which which come in front of us is deeply changed is deeply changed not as a, as a uh, how to say um, some kind of decision you know with, with, <laughs> when, we, when people decide oh i will be different you know in the future and, and then they try to introduce some changes in their life but th this is a result of uh, seeing things uh, more deeply or seeing them much closer to what they really are you know and and, and that that is what brings this uh, this deep change into into ourselves which is completely spontaneous then and natural you know it's not something we are forcing ourselves to do you know but then we realize all the benefits of this new way of um, of, of uh, um, uh, dealing you know with people with situation with with, mm. with everything and and um, this is a definite proof that we are right you know that what we see is right Mm -hmm. and what we do is also right because whenever our our uh, views and our action does not result in suffering we can be sure that they are right mm -hmm. we are on, that we are on the right path and uh, i think that that's the main point the lessening lessening suffering in ourselves and lessening suffering in our, our other people by the way we live and by the way we interact with these people i think this is uh, this is uh, uh, the most most important thing you know i think that's a great point the, the more we look deeper into ourselves the more we realize the interconnectedness that we have with others and the less we are attached to ourselves the more space we have to embrace others so these are interconnected they're not separable and i think Thank you so much for your great sharing. I think we're gonna open another floor to uh, our audience now. They will have great questions and hopefully uh, we, you can help them to understand further on the topic of martial art, compassion, then, and uh, let's move on to Q&A section. So great. We're coming to the Q&A session now. So for our audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to type in our live chat box right next to the video. So we do have some interesting question here already. Um, one question, well, okay. One question is, uh, I guess people are interested in what kind of martial arts do you practice Zarko? I, I guess uh, there, since we, we talk so much about martial arts, but we didn't really get to know what kind of martial arts you practice. And do you think that matters actually, since we were talking about how martial art is a potential tool to, to uh, cultivate spiritual paths. But I think there are many different kinds of martial arts, right? If you think about it right now, MNA is very popular, Muay Thai, it's a lot of beating them. So do you think certain martial art is more capable for spiritual search than other martial arts? Uh, yes, well, I think that uh, all traditional martial arts are more in, in, in uh, uh, how to say, uh, more capable for uh, some kind of spiritual development. You know, if... Uh, if somebody is uh, participating in martial arts, uh, which is uh, only connected with uh, fighting, and uh, you know that, that that's that's not really <laughs> that's not really it. <laughs> so the, there has to be this uh, uh, traditional way of uh, practicing, you know, uh, and also. Uh, practicing forms much more than, than uh, uh, sparring and, uh, and fighting and so on. Uh, because these forms can be used as a, as a meditation in movement very much. Mm -hmm. It 
they're, they're almost designed for that, you know. So uh, I think that um, only uh, traditional martial arts uh, have that approach, you know. Uh, MMA or what you mentioned earlier is 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 uh, you know is just a uh, well you know professional uh, uh, sport and it's it's not really traditional part of a traditional martial arts. Yeah, make makes sense, makes sense. So what what style of martial arts you practice again? I guess that was the <laughs> <first> question. <laughs> like I'm hiding this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, pra I practice uh, uh, Kempo. Kempo ah. is like, like uh, Okinawan, Okinawan uh, traditional uh, martial art. Yes. Actually, Kempo, if I understand the history correctly, came from the... It's really the Chinese form. That's right. All right. It's very close to the Shaolin... At least it's closer to the Shaolin style, right? If I remember correctly my martial art history. But I think you, you hit something that's very important. Traditional martial arts that has forms are the one that really more suitable for spiritual path, right? And I think one thing I want people to learn from our webinar today is also that sometimes when people think of a spiritual path, the most common image people have is sort of like the Time Magazine cover where you have a woman sitting there meditating as if that's the only way of cultivating ourselves. But then I think spiritual path, if we understood the concept of it, many different paths can lead to that direction, right? Tea ceremony, flower arrangement, art, music can all potentially be used as a tool to search ourselves. which I think earlier you also mentioned that when one practice martial art, it can go to two paths, make your ego bigger or make your ego smaller. So the key thing is really finding the right teacher. So what kind of recommendation do you have? And here's the, this is the question from our audience now. How do we know who's a right teacher? Or how do we find a good teacher? <laughs> That's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um... Well, I think that everyone who looks for a teacher uh, has to has to observe that person, has to uh, know that person better, and to see what what values in life, what what principles in life that that uh, person uh, uh, follows and expresses. You know, and uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to say. Uh, in, in martial art, if somebody wants to know whether whether certain teacher is uh, maybe teaching this spiritual aspect of, of art, he has to inquire into it uh, and uh, and see where this um, where this teaching is coming from. What kind of teaching is that, and how that person actually teaches? Well, I think the best way to the best way to uh, find out is to see how the person relates uh, with, with his close associate, with, uh, with, with other pe people around him, you know. So uh, we, can, we can sense somehow uh, uh, the character of that person, you know, and, uh, and maybe have, have, have some insight into, you know, whether that person can be our teacher or not. So it's it's a difficult to it's difficult to say you know um, generally, but uh, yeah. I think uh, this question is interesting because it's not just for martial art, but also it is. Sorry for my phone, <laughs> but but it's not just for mar finding a good martial art teacher, but finding a good spiritual teacher in general sometimes could be difficult right and i but i think what you say is that since spiritual practice it's about interconnectedness it's about relationship one of the best thing we can observe is actually their relationship with their disciples with their with other people because we probably gonna we probably learn best to observation 
and watching teachers action. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree with that. Definitely, you know, uh, we have to observe the person, but there is a, also something which is, which is not uh, fully rational there. You know, there is some kind of, uh, some ca- kind of, uh, uh, how can I say, affinity, you know, mm. which, which arises sometimes and which could be right, which could be right, not always. <laughs> <laughs> not always but but sometimes it could be right you know so i think it's 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 very important that we know uh, what is it that certain person teaches you know what is the teaching and uh, and how that person does that um, how he relate to people around him you know so th- there, there is a lot of thing to observe there mm-hmm. uh, uh, now you know there is a limit to what we can know, also, you know, and um, and uh, for that reason, we have to trust somehow, somehow this this inner sense, you know, whether whether some person is is a good teacher, right teacher, but also we have to consult other people, you know, and see what they think and uh, mm-hmm. how their their experience. Uh, what their experience are with that person and so on. So um, it, it's it's not always easy, you know. It's not always easy to find a teacher, and um, sometimes uh, sometimes it, it happens uh, without even much trying. You know? <laughs> and and uh, on the other hand, uh, some people are going from one teacher to another teacher, and they, they never find you know someone. With who, whom are satisfied. Mm-hmm. You know, th- there is a saying: uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I, I think. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, this is not just true in the spiritual world. Uh, it's also true sometimes in the therapy world, where people are looking for one therapist after another, because when you work with First therapist, it doesn't work. Now you have to try the second therapist. What I always encourage my students, for example, is that people should give some patience to get to know the therapist or get to know the teacher. Because sometimes we may judge too quickly on who we think is good and who we think may not be good or vice versa. So I think some patience to observe the teacher is important. I think, uh, yeah. So, uh, there, there is also, you know, sometimes people have idea that they deserve the best possible teacher. You know? <laughs> they have this ideal of, of the teacher, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the, the real teachers uh, have a difficulty of meet <laughs> those those ideals. You know, yeah. so. Yeah, it's a quite a complex issue, and uh, yeah. But I, I think you hit the great points because sometimes the difficulty of finding a good teacher has a lot to do with your own ego, or your own fixed view, which goes to what martial art training is really about, right? It's not just about combating another person, but it's really helping you potentially to understand the source of conflict, which. I think, as again, as we were talking about earlier, one of the key source of conflict we have is really our attachment, our attachment to identity, our attachment to our desires, right? Our attachment to our views. So I guess one thing that's interesting, and again, would be useful for our audience to review again, is what is the best attitude that we should have in learning more about our attachment? Like, where do we start? Let's say someone listened to our webinar today. They're like, okay, maybe I have an issue, but where can I start? What can I, what what should I do? What should I, like, what can I do to observe myself as a starter? Well, um, I think the, any discipline you mentioned before, whether it is a tea ceremony or a, a flower arrangement or a, a martial arts or whatever, 
you know, when, when we are engaged in, in, in those disciplines, uh, um, we, can, we can actually, well, we always, uh, you know, come in a kind, kind of uh, conflict with ourselves there. You know, there is always uh, difficulties, there is always a uh, uh, problem we experience, uh, you know, the, the process of learning and training is not an easy process. So th th this is, this is uh, uh, how we come uh, into uh, difficult situations. You know? So by coming into this difficult situation, we can see ourselves. We can see how we respond, how we react, you know, what are our strength, po strength points, what, are, what, what is our weak points, you know, and so on. So th this is how we learn about ourselves. You know, and the traditional methods like the martial arts are especially, uh, especially useful for that. You know, when, when, when you have, uh, at the very beginning, when, when some of, somebody starts to practice, there is a, there is a thousand and thousand of repetition of, uh, you know, one single technique or, or, or something, you know. And uh, if somebody comes to that in order to... Uh, in order to become a great fighter or something, you know, and then he meets situation which he can't connect with his ideal, you know, and, and, and the reason for to, for to uh, uh, come into martial arts in the first place, then, you know, it's a kind of test. It's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of situation in which we have to let go, let go of, uh, of our, uh, preconceived, you know, ideas and so on. And, uh, and I think through that process, we uh, learn about ourselves, we learn about our attachments and we learn to let go of those attachments. But again, it all depends on the atmosphere, you know, it, it all depends on the, on the, mm -hmm. uh, whether, whether someone who is teaching are deliberately creating such a creative situations for us to learn and find out or we are just you know um, in, in, in a process uh, completely left on our own you know so <clears throat> it, it depends a lot but I think these situations uh, in which uh, we uh, which we find difficult now, these are potentially very important, very important situation because there we uh, learn the most about ourselves. It, it's, uh, of course, it's always uh, easier said than done, right? It's, uh, it's, it's when we hit difficulties, we often just lost in our emotions. But sometimes the best entry point to understand where our attachment is, is really when we hit difficulties. Right. The, this is uh, the most difficult. The most difficult point sometimes is is the entry point to understand our attachment. Yeah, that, that, that's right. But uh, well, I, I I was talking about martial arts and some other forms of, of practices like uh, the ceremony and so on. But the meditation itself, you know, the meditation itself. Um, although all those forms could be used for a meditation. Mm -hmm. But uh, sitting meditation itself is, I think, a very direct and a very strong uh, practice, which uh, which directly lead us to to uh, discovery about who we are and mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know how to let go and so. On. Sure. Yes, that's definitely true because I think sitting is sort of the default. By default, the sitting meditation is sort of the default practice that allow one to observe oneself much deeper. And, and I think the more, and I, as we also talk about earlier, um, the more we observe, the more we are also become aware of the existential issues. And I think you've talked, we talk a little bit about how the awareness of impermanence can help us to take our life more seriously. I think the funny thing about impermanence, of course, is that we all know time is going to go on and we all know our life is limited. 
we all know we're going to get older and we're all going to get sick and we're all going to die. I mean, conceptually, we all know that. And yes, martial art is a sort of a symbolic way to remind you of death and dying, right? I mean, conflict, right? Conflict is about sometimes it's a, it's a symbolic way of talking about death and dying. But to, to talk about it and to really experientially know it is two different things, right? So, so what kind of words of encouragement would you have to encourage us to be more in touch with our existential issues in life? I think because that is sort of another area that we should be more interested in. Um, well, No, the 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 uh, attachment to self, attachment to ego, uh, is uh, feed by ignoring the impermanence. You know, it's denying by denying the impermanence. This is how how our ego survives, really, and how this sense of self becomes stronger or, or, or uh, is uh, maintaining its strength by denying impermanence. You know? And I think it's essential to see what that attachment to self is doing to us. You know, when, we, when we see uh, where our uh, suffering in life comes from, then uh, we will realize that uh, that uh, you know, relying on the ego and uh, um, and dealing with the life life situations uh, from the perspective of the ego is uh, is uh, just a way to perpetuate our own suffering. You know, and once we know that, uh, then of course uh, we would uh, naturally want to come in touch with the life as such, you know. Uh, and uh, the best way to do that is, you know, to uh, calm our minds, you know, and uh, uh, come to this present moment and uh, see what, what's there. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only moment uh, uh, which we really have, you know, the past is gone, the future is not yet here. And, uh, and the only thing we have is this present moment. And this mm -hmm. present moment uh, is, the, is the moment in which we uh, actually open ourselves to what is, what is there, what is here. Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, we, we can have a much closer look at who we are and how we create suffering and how this suffering is perpetuated and also how to let go of all this. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think that's uh, um, um, that's very, very important point, you know, in our life once we, once we see that, once we realize that. And it, on the other hand, it's a kind of adventure also. <laughs> it's a kind of adventure to find out about ourselves, you know, and uh, and um, uh, dive into this present moment and uh, discover the world again, because you know what we what we see, what we hear, what we know is a kind of a mental fabrication. You know, it's a it's a result of uh, it's a result of uh, a very narrow, uh, subjective uh, view, which is also painful. Uh, it's narrow and painful in the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, changing our perspective on, on things and, and on life in general, I think is a, is a, a, a worth trying. And, and, and a good thing to do. <laughs> yes. I, I think that's uh, well put. Though. I think our attachment are often really attaching, is the attachment to our mental fabrications. So it's worthwhile to have a good look 
at what that mental fabrication is about. And, and I think we have a few more questions, but I think those are could all, I guess they're more interested about you as a person. So for example, we have a question on what kind of martial art movie you think we should watch. <laughs> and, you know, which I guess I personally love movie because movie is a reminder of how we also live in a movie. So which martial art film you would recommend? <laughs> Oh, I'm not looking those anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not looking anymore, Marshall. Oh, you don't watch any of it? Okay. So, but I have one I could recommend. I think The Grandmaster, that I don't know, it's a movie about Itman, but the film itself okay. has. Yes, I, I saw that one. Yeah, you saw right. that one. So, yeah. so that one. That, that film is interesting. In the film, they talk about how the true martial art master will go through three stages of life. Seeing oneself, seeing the world, and seeing all sentient beings. That's what a true martial art master will go through. What do you think? Well, um... Couldn't, I couldn't say now anything about that because I, I don't have a you know, very clear idea. I, I saw the film, but obviously I wasn't uh, very you know, uh, careful, uh, carefully watching. Um, and uh, actually, I even don't know whether I saw the whole film. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think that some other films, very old ones, like, for example, uh, Seven Samurai by Kurosawa, oh. the director. I think, I think this film has, uh, has those principles we were talking about present very, very much in, 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 in there. You know? mm -hmm. so it, is possible to, it, it is possible to see this connection, uh, this uh, transformative power which martial arts have. Mm -hmm. you know, the one scene comes to my mind, and that is when they were testing those samurais, you know. So uh, uh, they had some kind of a cottage or something, and it was very dark inside, and they had to enter, and, uh, you know, those people who were testing them, <laughs> they were attacking them, you know. And, uh, and the first one who entered... Uh, he was attacked and he couldn't defend himself, so he was uh, disqualified, you know, by that. So the second one entered, but he was able to defend himself, so he was okay, good. Uh, but the third one did not enter at all. <laughs> <laughs> so he stayed out. He knew, you know, that uh, that uh, there is a, there is a, you know ambush actually yes, yes. Uh, being there, you know. So. And th th this is, you know, this is, uh, I think, very good example of how the conflict could be overcome, you know. Uh, but, you know, in the process to overcome a conflict, we had to learn how to deal with the, mm -hmm. with the, with the conflict, you know. Yeah. Much before we, can, be, before we can really overcome it, you know. And, um, and it's interesting, you know, in martial arts, uh, how it's done. It's done by redirecting the force hmm. and, uh, and letting someone um, uh, hit the empty space. You know, when somebody hit the empty space, mm -hmm. that person needs himself there. Mm -hmm. There is nobody else to meet there, you know. So uh, uh, then there is a possibility of, of uh, insight arising. What am I doing? You know, <laughs> I want to hurt someone, but am I hurting myself also by doing that and so on? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I'm sorry, I can't recommend many <laughs> martial arts <laughs> film, film to you, uh, but. Uh, uh, I'm sure in those older films, I don't know about the new films, but in older films, uh, there is a possible to find some principles mm -hmm. there uh, which are okay. You know? but, uh, but I think that the, 
the seven samurai that you talk about is I remember that scene now. The the third guy who just stand outside and avoid it. I think that is such a symbolic way. That's a sub, such a symbolic scene related to our talk, actually, because the best martial art artist is the one that knows how to avoid or redirect. Right, the spiritual path is like redirecting our negative emotion. In a way that can be beneficial for self and others, I, I think that that would sort of fits our theme of webinar today. Any last words you would have for our audience today? Like, what is one take home message you would like them to remember from our conversation today? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, anything what we do, anything what we do, uh, it, it does not necessarily uh, to be the martial arts or some uh, some you know some uh, uh, traditional discipline or, or, or anything and anything what we do can uh, serve as a, as a tool for our own inner transformation mm -hmm. you know? so really anything uh, if we change our approach if we change our attitude, if we uh, start doing it, you know, in a, in a, in, a, in a slightly different way at the beginning. You know, so, um, if we give ourselves, uh, our whole being, into what we do, you know, uh, then we will see result. Uh, um, of, of, of such attitude and uh, such approach you know? and for example uh, the way we the way we relate to other people uh, the way we uh, talk to these people the way we listen also it's very important you know mm -hmm. uh, this this kind of uh, shift in, 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 in our in our uh, approach to uh, people and uh, work we do and so on can can create really miracle in our life. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we can really change the quality of, of our life. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, we need to know some principles. You know, we, we need to uh, we need to know how to do it and so on. So what I I was uh, saying now is actually the practice of. Uh, uh, mind cultivation in daily life mm -hmm. so uh, people very often think that to cultivate the mind they they, they need to do something which is uh, you know special thing like a uh, serious meditation mm -hmm. in, in a monastery or somewhere and so on mm -hmm. and this formal practice is important that's 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 the truth but uh, on the other hand uh, our life should become practice, you know, mm -hmm. and our ordinary life situation uh, uh, can uh, uh, can become uh, the medium, if I can say so, for, for mm -hmm. our practice. And uh, just to change the attitude, you know, to open ourselves, uh, to open our minds, you know, and, and to relax and to... Uh, uh, deal with the situation uh, in, in a more relaxed way and uh, mm. uh, to let go of um, tensions and uh, 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 I'll say preconceived ideas about others, you know, trying to see others uh, uh, not through, through the lens of our previous experiences with them, but as, mm -hmm. as people who are also changing from one moment to another and seeing them uh, as they are right now when we are you know, in, in, in connection with them. So um, th this, this is all something which can, which can really uh, help us and also help other mm -hmm. people a lot. Um, Great. Thank you so much for your wonderful insight wisdom. Life should be our practice. I think that's something we can all take home today, right? Life is the practice. So thank you, Zarko, for coming to our webinar. I personally learned a lot from you, and I'm so happy that you can be our guest. 
really very grateful to have you here. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So for our audience, thank you for uh, staying with us and listen to this wonderful uh, webinar, one wonderful conversation that we have with Zarko. I want to uh, give you an introduction to our next speaker, which is on May 21st at 7 p.m. Our next speaker is Shannon Harvey, an award-winning director and journalist. Um, it's very wonderful to have her for our webinar because she has she is very connected to the mindfulness world. She has her own movies, books, and podcasts, and they all focus on the theme of well-being and mindfulness. One of her films was very impressive to me. is really the the film is called the My Year of Living Mindfully. It's almost like the Super Size Me documentary film, where she basically what Shannon did was she practiced mindfulness every day for a whole year, but she basically documented the changes. So for example, before she does that, she has all the scientific equipment, the functional MRI, her blood sugar level, her blood pressure, her physiological measures and her psychological measures. She record all that. And after a year later, she also record those again. So I think it's wonderful that you can check her movie out. But at the same time, please come to our May 21st webinar. And thank you again for coming where it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you. Good night.